What do you understand about the attributes of God? Today and tomorrow we're going to talk about his attributes, his absolute attributes and his natural attributes. Stay with me. I think as we go along you'll understand this better. Thank you for joining me again today. We're on a special subject and we're talking about the doctrine of God, the teachings of that there are in the Bible about the Lord our God. Now, if you studied this in seminary, you'd do a much vaster study, obviously. You look into the theories, and all we're doing is just going through the practical Word of God. And I'm giving you one or two references. There are many, many more. And if you ever get a textbook, you'll find it in the subject of systematic theology. But don't get worried about that. We'll look at it in much simpler terms. But I want you to understand the greatness, the wonder of the Lord our God. That's really my intention in this series. I've done this with our Bible study groups, and we've been having some great times, so I wanted to share with you. First of all, God's absolute attributes. What do I mean? Well, if you turn with me to John chapter 5 and verse 26, we read this, and I want to read the first part of the verse. For as the Father has life in himself... So he has granted the Son to have life in himself. For as the Father has life in himself. Well, what does that mean? Well, straight away, quite obviously, the Bible is saying to us that no one ever made God. No one ever created God. He simply is. He is self-existent. And because he is an absolute, I said to you yesterday morning, you cannot prove the existence of God. And no one can ever disprove the existence of God to you. You can find God for yourself. And we said you can find him in nature. You can find him clearly and completely in Jesus Christ. You can find him by his Holy Spirit. But when we come to God, he is self-existent. No one ever made him. Now, once you understand that, you begin to see the greatness of our God. He is self-existent. He has life in himself. But there's something else I want you to see. Amongst these absolute attributes, we find his immensity. Isaiah says to us in Isaiah 66 and verse 1, this is what the Lord says, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Now, obviously, we're trying to put something eternal into man's terms, and that in itself is very difficult, if not impossible. So what really is Isaiah saying? He said, well, if you think of the greatness of the heavens, our God just sits on them. And then you think of the earth, and for some time we thought the earth was pretty big. It seems to get smaller all the time with travel and with television. But by the same token, he says, oh, our God just uses the earth for a footstool. And when you think of the immensity of the heavens, and the scientists begin to tell us, they say, but we're in one galaxy, and there are other galaxies, and there are galaxies beyond that, and our God is involved in them all. And our God's the creator of them all. And our God is everywhere present in all those galaxies. This is the immensity of the God that we talk about on this radio program. Do you know him? Do you begin to understand him? Do you begin to see his greatness? These are his absolute attributes. Self-existent, fantastic, immense, marvelous. And also, he is eternal. He has an eternal quality. Now, let's think about his eternity. Psalm 90 and verse 2. And the psalmist says to us, Before the mountains were born, or the, you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, those are the words I want you to get hold of. From everlasting to everlasting, you're God. Let's go back in time. In the days of the Old Testament, God was there. On creation, God was there. He was creating. Go back before that, before creation, God was there. You go right back to the beginning of all things, God was there. And we've already said he was self-existence. God always has been. Everlasting, too everlasting, let's go forward. We think of the end of this world. One day Jesus will return. One day this old world will be wrapped up. One day there will be a new heaven and a new earth. 
God will be there in all that. God will be everlasting. And then we move into everlasting life, and it's going to go on and on, and God's going to be there, and you're going to be part of that. I hope, I pray, I'm going to be part of that. We are going to live forever in God, everlasting, on and on, and our minds just boggle at that. Because our minds are finite, because our minds are mortal, we can't even think that out. But our God, from His eternal perspective, He always has been, He always will be. Now there's something else. Because He is eternal, and because He has an eternal view of things, He sees things differently from the way you and I do. Now, I don't think we always understand that. And therefore, sometimes He does things in our life, or He allows things in our lives, that we don't understand. Because we look at them in the temporary, and He's looking at them in the eternal. And you have to know the words of the Bible where it says, His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are above our ways. Of course they are. He is always looking at it from the eternal perspective. He looks at your life from the end to the beginning. We can't do that. All we can see is a couple of years. We see what's happened. We see what may happen this week and forget the rest of it. But our God sees our lives from beginning to end. No wonder he sees things in a different way. No wonder his perspective is different. It's as though he looks down from heaven and he can see everything exactly as it is laid out before him. He's self-existent. He is immense. And yes, he is everlasting. He always has been. He always will be. Now there's something else. I want to go on to his natural attributes. And the first one is infinity. You'll find this in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 27. 1 Kings 8 verse 27. But will God really dwell on the earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Solomon's looking at the wonder of the temple that he's just finished there in Jerusalem. And it was obviously a wonderful structure. If you ever go to Jerusalem, begin to try and see the size of that temple. It was an incredible area. No wonder he looked and thought about it. But he says, how can God dwell there? He looks up to the heavens. He said, God can't even be contained in the highest heaven. He certainly can't be contained in a building. But the fact was that God chose to dwell in that building. Didn't mean he didn't dwell anywhere else. But for the children of Israel, first of all, he dwelt in the tabernacle. As they went through the wilderness, that's where God was. Then they came into Jerusalem, and when the temple was built, God chose to dwell in the temple. So in the Holy of Holies, there was the Shekinah glory. There was the presence of God. Now, the fantastic fact is, think of what I've shared with you this morning about his self-existence, about his immensity, the fact that our God is everlasting to everlasting. If you're a Christian believer listening to this program, if by faith you accepted Jesus Christ into your life, God has chosen to dwell in you. You have become a temple for him. Now that to me is mind-blowing. And what a paradox. On the one side, I'm talking to you about the greatness of our God. On the other hand, I'm saying, but that same God dwells in your life and dwells in my life. And that's why we can know him in and through Jesus Christ. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that fantastic? Our God dwells in us. Our God dwells in you and me. He has chosen in his wisdom to dwell in his people. And having said all this, and thought about the immensity, the greatness of our God, thought of the fact that he's always existed. No one ever made him. No one ever created him. He always will exist. Having said that, he wants you to know him. He wants to know you. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to spend time with you. He wants to be in your presence. He wants you in his presence. Have you spent time with him today? Or you say, Richard, I rushed out of the house this morning. I didn't have time. Uh, what are we saying? Are we saying, on the one hand, we have a God who is so great that nothing can contain him? And yet we have that same God dwelling in us, and yet we don't have time for him? And yet that's what happens. No wonder the Christian church is weak. No wonder we flounder. 
No wonder we don't know what we're doing. We don't even get with the one whose church it is. And God who dwells within us by his Holy Spirit doesn't even see us. Oh no, Lord, I have to get off to work. I've got this to do. You know how important I am. And God, the God, has chosen to dwell in his people. We have become the temples of the Holy Spirit. That is fantastic to me. But there's something else. In his natural attributes, I want to talk about the nature of God himself. And to help us, just three words from 1 John 4, verse 8. 1 John 4, verse 8. Let's think about this. God is love. God is love. Therefore, everything God ever does is love. And everything God ever allows in your life and mine is filtered through his love. God won't let anything happen to you as a child of God that is not filtered through his love. Oh, Richard, if you knew what I was going through at this moment. I don't, but God does. God also knows how much you can take, how much you can stand, because he understands you perfectly, and he dwells within you, and you are in his hands if you belong to Jesus Christ, and no one can pluck you out of his hands. You are a hundred percent secure in the Lord your God. But come back on this whole thought that God is love. That means the creation of this world came out of love. The gift of our Lord Jesus Christ came through his love. Everything that he ever does is in love. Now, that's beautiful. Now, if we're going to walk this Christian life, that too has to come from love. The premise, the basis of our Christian living has to be love. And if we don't have that, we've missed the real basis of everything. You see what Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. This is where it all starts. If I don't have that, I don't have anything. 1 Corinthians 13, the opening three verses tell you, if you don't have love, you amount to nothing at all. If I don't have love, I amount to nothing at all. The whole key is love. Why? Because God is love. And when it is that love, God is there. God is within us. God is moving through our words. God is in our actions. And that's what makes them valuable. Well, we have a mighty God, but he's chosen to dwell in us. And who is he? He's love. He is pure love. 